Welcome back, my friends. Currently, we're on day 365 of Russia's disastrous invasion of Ukraine. And for an entire year now, I've been saying the exact same opener for all of my update videos about Ukraine. So fair warning to all my subscribers going forward. I'm no longer going to be saying what day of the war we're on, and I'm going to mix up my intro a little bit. But I did this the last year because I felt like it was important. Important to acknowledge what day of the war we're on, proving that Ukraine could resist Russia. And I think going back a year, people have kind of already forgotten about this, that most military and intelligence experts were telling Western governments that if Russia chose to invade Ukraine, Kyiv would fall. Kyiv would fall between three and seven days, that's what the Russians were saying. Maybe it might be dragged out two weeks or a month. So this photo, uh, taken by Zelensky with members of his government, I believe was taken on day three. So Russian disinformation was being pumped out that the government in Ukraine had collapsed and Zelensky had fled. So he took this picture or video with members of his government in a well-known location so that people in Ukraine knew that they were resisting this invasion. They were fighting back against the Russians. This picture down here was, I believe, day 100. The same men from Zelensky's government in the same location, proving that Russia had failed. By day 100, they were no longer even threatening the capital city of Kyiv. So now that we've made it to day 365, it's only a matter of time before Russia is defeated and pulls back from all of Ukraine's sovereign territory. So how did Russia uh, celebrate their failed sneak attack against Ukraine? And Putin held a rally and says that Russia is fighting for historical lands. So President Putin said Russia is fighting for its historical lands on Wednesday as the country approaches the or it hits the one-year anniversary of their bloody invasion of Ukraine. Speaking at a state-organized concert the day before Defender of the Fatherland Day, which is a national holiday, Putin delivered a notably short address to a crowd of tens of thousands of people. Now, this was primarily a concert with musical acts performing. Uh, for those lucky enough to attend, they got to enjoy... Uh, musical numbers such as this guy. So here's a guy in a military uniform saying it is a war when Putin himself has never called it a war. And then he states, we didn't start it when Russia definitely started it. And then he says, we'll fly a bright red flag over Berlin. How is Russia going to make it to Berlin when they can't even take the city of Bakhmut? And these pro-war rallies that Putin insists on having, they're getting more and more pathetic. So the attendees are forced to be there. And they're primarily university students and government employees. University students and government employees are exempt from being mobilized. So if they don't attend, they might no longer be university students or government employees exempt from mobilization. So there's a very strong reason for these people to attend even if they don't want to. On top of that, they were promised free food if they just showed up. And despite the Russian government's best attempts, this was still poorly attended. The stadium was nowhere near full. You can see large sections uh, probably facing the stage, so it's not as apparent to the cameras. But for people who brought their smartphones to the events, this place looks pretty empty, empty despite uh, Russian flags being placed at every chair. And when Putin came on, he only spoke for three and a half minutes. Lasting three and a half minutes must be a record for Putin. And here is a uh, small taste of his speech. 
гордимся и в их честь трижды ура! 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 Они должны услышать наше приветствие. Сегодня их поддерживает вся страна. А это значит, что каждый, кто это делает, в известной степени тоже является защитником Отечества. This is the second time that Putin has insisted that a crowd chants in unison Ura, 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 kind of like his own personal version of Zieg Heil, Zieg Heil, Zieg Heil. I don't really feel like the crowd was feeling it. And to contrast Putin speaking to a crowd, here's President Biden speaking the day before in Poland. One year ago, the world was bracing for the fall of Kyiv. Well, I've just come from a visit to Kyiv, and I can report Kyiv stands strong. <laughs> Kyiv stands proud. It stands tall. And most important, it stands free. Kyiv remains free. And these rallies that Putin insists on having, it's all fake nationalism, fake patriotism. Uh, people are handed flags that they're required to wave around while in the stadium. But as soon as they leave, they throw the flags away. They didn't bring them themselves. So here's a video of a Russian woman filming the crowd leaving the stadium. And as soon, as soon as Putin went on stage and spoke for three minutes after that, everyone just kind of started bailing on the event, even though there were more uh, musical acts at the concert. This woman behind the camera says that the free food and tea ran out and people were cold and they just wanted to leave. <laughs> Гречка закончилась, хот-доги тоже закончились, примерно в час 30 все закончилось. So you can hear that the concert is still going on in the background, and despite in the stadium, everyone is looking happy, waving a flag, you notice leaving the stadium, there's no flags. There's no poster boards with Zs and, you know, death to NATO and the Nazi West. None of these people are dressed up in patriotic outfits for a concert event. They were forced to be there and they, they wanted to leave as soon as possible. And it's worth reflecting on who the heck is this guy? So a day before this concert rally, Putin gave his speech to the nation in which he spoke and rambled on for 80 minutes, complaining about various grievances and the Nazi West and the real Putin doesn't let anyone get within 30 meters of him. So to his uh, speech to the nation, he walked out on stage and then immediately walked off. He didn't shake anyone's hand. He didn't even get close to or interact with anyone in his own government. Meanwhile, allegedly the next day, he appears in this giant stadium uh, filled with tens of thousands of people, and he's seen hugging and shaking hands with various people on the stage, speaking for only three minutes. So I don't know who the heck this guy is, but this is the real Putin, and the real Putin doesn't let anyone get close to him. <laughs> but one group of people that the real Putin would like to get closer to is the Chinese. On the one-year anniversary of Russia's invasion of Ukraine, China has chosen to show support for Russia by sending their top diplomat to Moscow. So China's foreign ministry has denied any plans to provide lethal aid to Moscow for use in the Ukraine war and blamed the United States and NATO for spreading what it called false information about China's involvement. So in the last couple days, the United States has said they have an intelligence report uh, showing that China is considering sending lethal aid to Russia for use in Ukraine. Now, the United States is publicly stating this in order to spook uh, Chinese businesses. If China does provide lethal aid to Russia, there has to be a response, at least economic sanctions. This would be very bad for the global econo economy, but especially China's economy. 
So I think the intent and the hope is this will spook Chinese businessmen enough to make a phone call to President Xi and say, uh, a year into this thing, it's not looking good for Russia. We shouldn't get involved. Foreign Ministry spokesperson Wang Wenben added that NATO should stop smearing China with unfounded speculations on Ukraine, abandon the old Cold War mentality of zero-sum game, and block confrontation. Last time I checked, it wasn't the West or NATO trying to return us to a Cold War era. It's Putin. Putin is the one trying to rebuild the Soviet Empire and uh, get the Cold War going again. But look at this video. Look at this incredible video of Putin uh, getting close to the Chinese. So this video is absolutely hilarious for the most subtle reason, and it's because he's sitting at this ridiculously long table, this James Bond villain table, and when President Macron comes to visit him, they sit the long way. When German Chancellor Schultz visits him, they sit the long way. This is how Putin treats members of his own civilian cabinet. But when the Chinese show up, and maybe they might provide the Russians with some weapons, uh, they, they sit uh, the narrow way. They sit closer to each other. I mean, this is Putin... Uh, this is Putin basically on his knees, begging the Chinese for help. Uh, that's how I interpret him sitting at this table when this is what he does to other world leaders. And in general, Muscovites shrug as Russia marks one year of war in Ukraine. As the first anniversary of Russia's invasion is here, life in the capital largely goes on as usual with most Muscovites saying that the dominant mood is one of indifference to the ongoing fighting. It doesn't really feel like there is a war going on, said a Muscovite in his 30s who spoke to the Moscow Times. One can easily adapt to any circumstances the longer this conflict goes on and the more people just accept the situation. So the reason why uh, the average citizen of Moscow or St. Petersburg doesn't feel like a real war is going on is because nobody is threatening Russia. Nobody living in Moscow is being threatened except by Putin mobilizing them and sending them to Ukraine. So President Biden did uh, hammer home this point in his speech that he made in Poland. I speak once more to the people of Russia. The United States and the nations of Europe do not seek to control or destroy Russia. The West was not plotting to attack Russia, as Putin said today. And millions of Russian citizens who only want to live in peace with their neighbors are not the enemy. This war is never a necessity. It's a tragedy. President Putin chose this war. Every day the war continues is his choice. He could end the war with a word. It's simple. If Russia stopped invading Ukraine, it would end the war. If Ukraine stopped defending itself against Russia, it would be the end of Ukraine. And there's only one person in the world today that can end this war immediately, and that's Vladimir Putin. He's the sole reason why this war continues. It will only be when Putin is removed or his military accepts such a horrendous defeat that they have to pull back to Russian territory, that this war will end. And here's the contrast. When NATO expands, it's because a country asked to join the defensive alliance. And once in the alliance, there has not been a war between NATO members in 80 years. That is a huge accomplishment for these countries. Meanwhile, when Russia chooses to expand, they destroy absolutely everything and kill everyone just to expand their borders and take the territory. This right here is Ruski Mir. 
And they talk about empire so casually now on Russian state TV. They're no longer pretending like there's any kind of altruistic goals with their invasion of Ukraine. It's simply about empire. Putin has been in dictatorship. Стремление возродить империю, как будто бы и что-то плохое в империи. Ну, я пообещал новые санкции, а также пригрозил пятой статьей НАТО, если случится нападение. So Olga, the host of this uh, this news broadcast on Channel One, just casually opens her segment by saying, uh, "Biden has accused Putin of trying to restore an empire, as if there's something bad about empires." Wow. So here it is. Here's the map that Putin stares at and says, this is what belongs to me. I am the 21st century czar of Russia. These people and these lands that belong to the czars a hundred years ago should belong to me today. So here is the height of the Russian Empire prior to their collapse during World War I. And Russia controlled Finland, the Baltics, most of Poland, Ukraine, Moldova, parts of Romania, the Caucasus. These are the historical lands that Putin talks about, uh, restoring the greatness of the Russian Empire. And this next clip I want to share with you guys uh, concerns a member of parliament in the UK. Her name is Nadia Whitom. I don't know anything about her politics, so please don't uh, give me a comment about what she said in the past. But I do want to share this clip in which she was speaking to Parliament, and she identifies as being anti-war, but she acknowledges the necessity of supporting Ukraine uh, against Russian aggression. I speak as a socialist, an anti-imperialist, and as someone who feels disgust at the thought of war. And it's not despite these values that I support the Ukrainian resistance, it's because of them. To me, socialism means self-determination for ordinary working people, not ceding power to tyrants seeking to oppress them. Anti-imperialism means opposing all states that seek to extend their power by dominating others, regardless of what flag they fly. It's impossible to talk about the war in Ukraine without addressing the bloody history of Russian imperialism. It's a history that our friends across Eastern and Northern Europe don't need to be reminded of. They know that, that what's at stake is not just lines on a map and whose flag flies above a town hall. No, a, a nation that survived the Holodomor understands the invader's aims, the erasure of a people, the eradication of its culture and the destruction of its democracy. It's easy to debate geopolitics from the comfort of London, but the stakes feel very different when you hear directly from someone sleeping in a bomb shelter. And when I speak to workers, to trade unionists in Ukraine, or to refugees hoping to see their home again, they're met. So in the coming months, we're going to be hearing a lot from anti-war activists and anti-war commentators such as Tucker Carlson or Marjorie Taylor Greene. And somebody made a handy-dandy cheat sheet to translate what they're saying. When people like Tucker Carlson say Ukraine should negotiate a ceasefire, what they really mean is let Russia prepare for a new offensive. Ukraine should seek compromise to achieve peace. Let Russia continue genocide on occupied territories. Ukraine should be neutral. I don't recognize Ukraine's right to protect its democracy. Stop funding the war. Take away Ukrainian ability to protect its democracy. Let's negotiate with Russia to prevent nuclear war. Countries with nukes can change borders in any way they want. If Russia is allowed to use their nuclear arsenal to redraw the lines of their empire, then it's never going to stop. If it worked this time, it'll work again. And this sends a dangerous message to other countries, such as North Korea, Iran, China, that if you have nuclear weapons, the West democracies can't stop you. The nuke is the ultimate trump card. You can invade whoever you want and redraw your own borders. It's not going to be allowed. <laughs> so on Kremlin State TV, they're really struggling to understand why is the West continuing to support Ukraine 
even after 365 days. Their master plan was that the West was going to lose interest and give up on supporting Ukraine. Здесь было сказано, что победа и безопасность государства бесценны. Абсолютно с этим согласен. Но здесь вопрос, какое, что подразумевается под стратегическим поражением? Чего именно хочет Запад? Что они надеются на то, что ВСУ войдет на Красную площадь или на Донецкий Ленинград? Нет. Они к чему стремятся? Они стремятся втянуть, уже втянули Россию в затяжную многолетнюю войну, в которой Россия будет тратить и тратить и тратить свои ресурсы, а они будут только финансовое обеспечение и и вооружение передавать. Они хотят таким образом нанести поражение. They're so close to figuring it out. They're so close to understanding. But yes, the goal is to weaken the Russian economy and destroy the Russian military so that Russia can no longer threaten any of their neighbors ever again. Now, there has been no economic knockout yet from the West's sanctions on Russia. They have performed better than I think anyone expected they would the last year. But we're now heading into year two, and we shall see how they fare. But this arrangement between Russia energy exports and European consumer demand, Russia gambled everything that Europe could not live without Russia. But here's the chart proving that they can. So this is the price of natural gas in Europe currently at 48 euros per megawatt hour. This is a two-year low for the price of gas in Europe. So alternative gas sources have now been uh, shipped to Europe. Uh, you know, they, they brought some coal fire burning plants back online. They're not decommissioning nuclear plants. We're a year into this conflict, uh, exiting winter, and uh, Europe's energy security needs are being met. They're not ideal. They're not perfect. But Europe is finding a way to live without Russia, and this is bad for Russia. We're now going to see year two if Russia's economy can survive, running huge uh, monthly budget deficits. Other thing we should quick mention is that Russian air defense system in occupied territories went nuts the other night, and there was uh, multiple strikes in multiple locations at the same time. But the one that has everyone scratching their heads is Mariupol. This is the first time that Ukraine has been able to reach or bomb the city of Mariupol. Mariupol strikes raise questions about possible new Ukrainian long-range weapons. Mariupol is about 50 miles from the front lines, which is just outside the range of HIMARS and M270. So it's possible that they drove a truck right into the village of Vuladar. That would be incredibly risky for that HIMARS launcher. Uh, But Russia has thought the city of Mariupol was safe. They've been concentrating troops in this city before uh, sending them to the front lines, assuming that amassing troops in the city was safe for their forces. So how exactly did the Ukrainians strike these targets in Mariupol? We don't really know yet, but it is possible that new weapon systems are being introduced into Ukraine. Uh, Something that was just announced that will be a game changer this summer is wing kits for Ukraine's JDAM bombs uh, are going to be a big problem for Russia. The JDAM ER would give Ukraine roughly the same range as the uh, Gimlers, the M31 rockets fired by HIMARS, but with warheads up to 10 times the size. So this is the next uh, surprise that the Americans have for the Russians. Ukraine is reportedly uh, going to receive, it's called the uh, Joint Direct Attack Munition Extended Range, or JDAM-ER. And this is an air-launched precision-guided bomb uh, with a range of about 45 miles. So it's not a longer range weapon, but it's a more powerful one. And I think this is important to note that Why would the United States be mass-producing and giving air-launched precision-guided bombs if they also weren't going to supply or make an announcement on planes? You can't really use air-launched precision-guided bombs unless you have a way of getting them in the air. 
but the contract uh, has been signed with Boeing for these uh, these JDAMs. Uh, the contract is set to be completed by June 30th. So this summer, these very large, very deadly bombs will be uh, greeting the Russians on the front lines. So lots to look forward to as far as uh, military capability and ex explosive firepower this summer. Here's a cool video for you. Uh, the Czechs have started mass producing these inflatable HIMARS and M270 launchers, and they're delivering about 35 of them to Ukraine every month. So hundreds of these things will be littered in the woods out in the middle of nowhere in order to fool, distract, and waste the time and resources of the Russian military. I love it. Final clip I have for you, uh, since we reached the one-year mark, I think it is important to reflect on and remember all those that Ukraine has lost. This clip is of a Ukrainian warrior talking about losing uh, some of his comrades. Якось буденна прийшла новина. Прийшов боєць ввечері з ТВНом, з їжею, термос такий, з їжею. Наливає суп. Каже, загинули. Так буденно за мискою супа. Розповів про трагедію. We made it to day 365. I hope this war doesn't last another 365. That's all for this update video. Glory to the heroes, glory to Ukraine. If you found this video informative, give me a thumbs up. Best way to support the channel. Comments or questions, let me know down below. I love hearing from you guys. Till the next video, take care, be safe.